Angus Young. How you doing? Good, Becca. The offspring. How's it going, Becca? Dave Grohl. How you going, mate? Good, man. Pete, it's been a long time coming. Oh, Becca, hasn't it indeed? We go inside the dressing room, speak to the biggest names in music. Keith Richards, the Rolling Stones. And crack open their esky. This is exactly how I imagined you, by the way, sitting opposite me with a vodka and orange. You're a discerning chap. This is The Rider. Hey, it's Becca. Welcome back to The Rider. Season four technically ended... Just a couple of weeks ago with an incredible chat with Casey Chambers. Also, we had interviews uh, throughout that series with Quan from The Gurge, John Toogood from She Had, Missy Higgins, Birds of Tokyo, Diesel, Spiderbait, Paul Dempsey and Bernard Fanning. But it had to come back for one more when this superstar put out his 29th studio album, Fever Longing Still. I had to talk to this guy, Paul Kelly. He's about to go on tour next year. He's doing some shows with this new album out. Let's take a look back at the amazing career of Paul Kelly. Nineteen eighty-two. Nineteen eighty-five. Nineteen eighty-six. 1987. He was running through the cane in the pouring rain on a limited to her door. 1988. I lost my shirt. I've worn my rings. I've done all the dumb things. 1989. What makes such a sweet guy dance for me? 1991. Take your time. 1994. You know, and I know that love never runs on time. 1996. Tell him all I'm sorry. 1998. Started with a kid. 2017. I wouldn't candle. Now, 2024. That is Hound's Tooth Dress off this 29th studio album from Paul Kelly, Fever Longing Still. There is so much to talk about in the next half hour with the amazing Paul Kelly, who is all set to also announce an arena tour which is happening next year. And in fact, that's the first time Paul has headlined arena shows. So it's going to be a special year for Paul Kelly. Paul, how are you? It's great to have you here. Uh, you played your show at the ESPY just last night. How was that? It was a real, a real fun night. We haven't the whole band hasn't played together since March, so that was that was that was just great in itself. But also, first time we, we played, we played about eight eight songs from the new record. We played some old ones as well, but yeah, just the first time playing playing those songs, you know, sending them out in public for the first time. That's always pretty exciting, and it was a you know. Crowded room. It's really quite hot. Hot, hot and sweaty crowd. Happy crowd. Great fun. It is a hot room, isn't it? I, I've been to a few gigs at the the SB, and and you're right. It's there's no air conditioning. But I mean, um, a lot of these songs, I guess, have been in the can for a long time. I I know Northern Rivers. You know, like you put that out in 2022, and it must get so exciting to finally package all these up and hand them over, and and then get the feedback afterwards. Yeah, it's a funny. It's a, it's, a, it's a you know a bit like the the method is a bit like the old you know when albums used to mean just a collection of singles you know so uh, it was I guess it was Frank Sinatra that you know, first started to get the idea of let's make an album you know uh, a, a considered considered piece around a theme but I'm pro- probably digressing. We've recorded over the last um, four or five years. That I just go into the studio when I've got some songs and record record them with the band and then work out what to do with them later and when i've got enough songs that seem to sort of fit a record then that's how we sort of put the record together but in the course of doing that um you know sometimes we we release song northern rivers was i was putting out this compilation these sort of mixtape compilation records uh, around it around themes and one of the themes was rivers and rain and every time we do one of these mixtape things uh, we like to sort of Put something new out so we sort of slipped out northern rivers early on that but i always knew 
that it should be on this record as well. Are the songs that you and the band do as a like a warm up, as a like a cu- great cover, or even one of your earlier songs? Is there something you, you you perform just to get everyone loosened up again? Is there is there a go to? There are songs we, we pretty much have a tradition in the band room before shows that we'll you know, sing songs, not my songs. Um, the Brits, you know, um, Lazy Sunday Afternoon or some Bowie or great warm-up songs. Ash has got a million, so we're usually warm, warming up with, with songs like that. Sometimes The Weight, you know, by, by the band. Yeah, yeah. Um, oh, that, there's a few. Tin Soldier, Pete likes Pete, our drummer likes to have a crack at Little Tin Soldier and we all, all sing along. Before you know it, you might actually have a covers album for all yeah, of these right. warm-up songs, you know. But that's just, yeah, that's just get the voices going and get us, get, get us up and yeah, just get us in a, a certain energy level before you walk on stage. Yeah. Tell you what, the 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 album um, is out this week, and and Hound's Tooth Dress is the current single, and that that's a really that's a song you can really play loud. It's 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 not a you know a, a, a sort of a slow love song. It's it's got a bit of fatness to it. It's got a bit of meat in the bones, and uh, you know you you must be really happy with how that turned out. It turned out um, it was one of those lucky ones where we got got on the first take, so you can sort of hear from the chat at the start of the song. Um, and because it was a song that had only just been written before, you know, just before one of our recording sessions. So I had to t- teach it to the band on the fly. It's very minimal. I think, you know, our engineer, Steve Schramm, who, who engineers our record, he, he loves getting the performance and he's a non-fussy engineer. He doesn't care about spill or doesn't want things to be super clean. It's all about catching the performance. So, you know, They've always had the, the tapes always running when we're in there, luckily. Um, I think what makes give that song that uh, he, I mean, he's treated the drums pretty heavily, you know, sonic effects on the drums. And then Dan got, got a, quite a distinctive tone in the guitar. I'm playing the piano and it's really, really simple piano. So the song's quite, <clears throat> there's not much on it. And I think so, often when you have songs that, um, you don't put too much stuff on them. They, you can, they can, you can, they get really big. You can crank them up because you just got these bare bones. That sometimes with songs that have got a lot of overdubs and stuff on them, you, you turn it up and it's like your yeah, ears start bleeding. But but this one's just got all the space in it. Yeah, yeah, and um, you know everyone's got to go to to um, at the start of writing. You know sometimes you got writer's block and you just need something to to get you going. Um, I remember. We caught up years ago, and you were saying how sometimes you, you go back to other people's songs to take a bit of inspiration, and then that leads to something completely different. But at least it helps you along. And I think I think you said the Hoodoo Gurus might have been deftifying. I think it was you were, you were saying how that 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 was a song you used. Is, is that how you still do things? You know, you, you play your own songs, you play other people's songs, and then just see what comes up. Yeah, um, deftifying. I think that was um, what was that? Hum the messenger with that one day, you might, yeah. I think that, um, there was a bit of an echo of death defying and that, that happens all the time. I, I it's sort of part of I, I learn other people's songs uh, quite regularly. That's just I th- that's sort of for me that's part of part of my work, part of my job. It's just, I think if you're a, a writer, you have to read. If you're a songwriter, you have to play other people's songs um, just to figure out how they work. It takes time. It's not like I learn a song and then the next song I write is going to be a, a, a lot like that song. But it all it all sort of it sort of filters in and um, gets somehow in, into your into your into your body and your and your brain and and little little influences start to work work their way into your own songs. I think that's the way you, the way you learn stuff or the, is by loving other people's. Uh, loving other people's work, falling falling in love with it. You, you grew up in Adelaide, and, and you moved to to Melbourne, and and straight away got into the, the the music scene. Can you imagine back then as leather clad Paul Kelly, the new kid on the scene, and now you're the elder statesman? I mean, did, did, did <laughs> can you believe that sometimes? Yeah, um, I, I guess I hadn't looked that far ahead. Although I'm, I'm, I was always aware that a lot of the people I loved their music played to an old age. You know, muddy waters and people in country music and folk and blues just it was like it, it was just that's what you did 
Whereas, you know, people tend to think of, you know, pop music or rock music as having sort of shorter lifespans. But, I mean, that, that all changed, obviously, mm. um, with, with the 60s artists still going around. <laughs> so I, I guess I thought, oh, I, I thought I'm, I'm going to be in this for the long term if, I'm a, if I can make it work. Um, but you're right, moving to Melbourne in 1977 was really exciting. It was a lot, a lot of bands, a lot of bands playing, a lot of venues. I was very fortunate that I... You know, I, I knew someone who knew these guys in a band um, that were called Parachute, uh, and they they ended up sleeping on their floor and in a share house. And um, most of the band was in that house, and they'd, they'd, they'd rehearse in the, the front room. So I was straight into the, you know, straight. I, I got jumped straight into the to the. Um, to the music scene in Melbourne. We lived just across the road from the Kingston Hotel. And uh, I remember seeing the sports there for the first time, Jojo's up in the Falcons. Um, and then all, all the bands around, the Millionaires and bands like Man and Machine and um, uh, Bleeding Hearts, all these Melbourne bands that um, just went along to these gigs and you know had their head blown off. It's fantastic. <laughs> But then you moved to Sydney, so I, th- I think it was '85 from mem- memory. Like that's a a big move after quite a short time, really. Um, what what made you do that move? Was there was there pressure from anyone? Was, was the record company? That was nothing really to do with you know music. It was more fa- a family situation and uh, a breakup and having a child together. So um, yeah, ended up moving to Sydney for that for those reasons. Things had been bumping along in Melbourne. Things weren't going that great. Had made a couple of records. Um, Hadn't done that well. Was um, still sort of working out what how to write songs. Just felt it's time for a change. Many Sydney so siders will cool. claim that you uh, your music was better out of Sydney. That was your sweet spot. <laughs> there really was a sweet spot in terms of popular songs. I lived in, in Sydney from eighty four to ninety. A lot of records in that time. Um, you know, mostly at Trafalgar Studios in Annandale. So yeah, we made made. Post in Sydney, at um, Clive Shakespeare's place. Um, then we made Gossip Under the Sun, both in Sydney. Mm. We made uh, the next record in the States. Then, you know, back to Sydney again for comedy. So, yeah, um, and a lot of the songs, songs I still play at shows were written and recorded in Sydney. So, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Maybe it's true, anyway. <laughs> the new album, Fever Longing Still, tell me about the title. Um, first of all, um, so that's from Shakespeare. Yeah, it's from a, uh, a sonnet of Shakespeare's, yeah. Sonnet 147, and it's the opening, opening lines. My love is like a fever longing still for that which longer nurseth the disease. That's a, it's a, a love sonnet um, about the highs uh, and lows or the dark and light of love. So I thought that's a kind of good title for the record. I like the way it roll, just rolls off the tongue. Fever longing still, and once I had that title, then sort of, uh, I also, uh, you know, had this photo of a hound street dress, and thought, okay, that's going to go well together. Yeah. So, yeah, don't never really think about these things too much, but they, once you sort of get a couple of things that work together, then you, then you sort of know you're onto something. And you got an un- uncanny knack of writing just all time great love songs. What emotions do you? bring in when you're writing some of these ones is it is it is it the feeling of loss or is it just the overwhelming feeling of love is it a bit of both it's it's such your strength i guess it comes from storytelling so my love songs are, are always seem to have more than two people in them mm-hmm. and i guess that's just from this is the way life is when you mm-hmm. you're with someone or you meet someone um and you, and you fall in love or you, you stay you, you stay in love for a long time or you you stay together forever or you break up or all the different stories of love but there's, there's never just two people involved there's there's uh there's you meet someone and they've got they've got exes or they might have children they've got siblings they've got parents um they've got friends so uh i, I was early on i i realized that i wanted to you know get those complexities into into songs that my love songs weren't, weren't always just about two people i mean sometimes they are houndstooth dress is just 
just those two people. But um, it's it's a little bit lusty as well. Obviously, you know, you walk into a room and I want to show you off, and I want to see all the men look around at you, and <laughs> I love that too. Yes, yeah, it's, it's yeah. There's no not, not much subtext in that song. It's <laughs> not at all. Design. I also loved. Just your storytelling with um, going to the river with Dad as well, the way you described, you know, the, the sounds, the birds, um, what you're doing. And, and that's the other thing. It's just um, being a storyteller is not a skill everyone has. Yeah, I'm pretty uh, – uh, just, you know, my natural bent is to be quite visual in songs. I was always influenced by the visual songwriters like you know, Lou Reed, Chuck Berry, Ray Davies from the Kinks, their, their, their songs, you can see those, you can see their songs. They're like m- little movies. So um, that's 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 sort of crept into the, oh, it's always been there in the way I write, that you can um, see the songs, you know, you can mm. see the, got the, the, the cockatoos, the kettle, the kettle whistling, kettle singing in the kitchen, the cockatoos, the birds on the river. Um, thing at the back of the boat, yeah. I just, just just the way I like to write. It puts you it's just a way of putting putting the listener right there. Yeah. Do you have moments where you you go, I wish Kadinsky was still here. I, 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 he would be so proud of this record, like because he was so passionate for your every release and every tour you did. Do you have moments where you could pick up the phone and? Yeah, yeah. You know? I miss I miss those phone calls. You know, yeah. very funny. You know, he'd, he'd ring up Bill, my manager, and say, "Can I get Paul to do this?" And Bill said, "No." He'd ring up Bill again. Can you look? I really love Paul to do this. And Bill said, "No, I can't." <laughs> then the next thing, burp, burp. Ah, Michael, yeah. You know, well, what are you reckon about doing this? So, I've, I've, I've probably said no to Michael more times than I said yes, but it was always, you know, I, I had so much um, respect for him that you know we we had our battles, and uh, you know, I. I Left the record company, and uh, he, he argued, you know, stated his case and uh, argued strongly for, for me to stay. But I left, and but it wasn't one of those hold a grudge or it wasn't much. He wasn't petty like that. And I know that's not just my experience. He was really. Uh, I know he would ring up other people, and, uh, people from other record companies, if one of their artists had done well, and congratulate them. He was all. He was very much a supporter of the whole Australian echo, you know, music ecosystem. Uh, of course, fiercely competitive, of course, and, and you know, for sure it rubbed some people the wrong way, but I, I always loved, loved his, uh, his, his generosity and his just, you know, roll up your sleeves and get on with it. I really think he came, came to the fore big time in COVID, you mm. know, because he just, that sort of energised him and he, the... The things he did, setting up TV shows and uh, shows around the country, and all these little innovations, getting, getting, setting up busking in Melbourne, just ways to help us all get through COVID. He was really, really great. Yeah, yeah, and that's the thing. He, he rallied the troops, and he he was also brutally honest. I remember him saying at the time, he's like, "This is going to be five years, you know, but until we're completely back to normal, if we ever." Are. Um, I'm, I'm, that shocked me when he said that, um, yeah. but uh, he was right. He was pretty much bang on. Industry's tough at the moment, but you must be so grateful you're able to um, get the band together and and, and do albums like this. Um, was it partly done in different? You know, bits and pieces. I think I think one of the songs, at least, was written, well, was recorded in New Zealand. Uh, was it Neil Finn's studio? You went over there, is that right? That's right. Yeah. So, yeah, the songs from about uh, the, the albums from I'd say four different recording sessions over the last four or five years. Um, the way that's sort of the way I work now. I just when I got a bunch of songs, I just get the band together and we record them, and then you know, sort of stockpile them until I can see an album taking shape. So what happened with this? We generally work with an engineer called Steve Schramm because we he just we love the way he captures the band live. He's he loves spill. He doesn't, he doesn't worry about things have to be all clean. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and he's all about the performance. So he he moved to New Zealand. I'd introduced him to Neil Finn a while back, and they hit it off. And he's done a lot of work with Neil. And he's ended up working at Neil's studio Roundhead in Auckland. So he's sort of like the house guy there. Mm. Um, does his own projects and does a lot of work with Neil. So after, you know, 
so many sessions with uh, Steve having to travel to us to work. I said, well, let's, we'll go to you for a change. I was also like giving ourselves a little treat because, um, you know, go to a really, it's a really nice studio. There was, a, and there's one other session that was sort of different to all that was we were playing at Mona Foma, the festival in Tasmania earlier this year in March. And they said, um, oh, you know, would you like to use our recording studio for a day? Um, so we said, yeah, why not? I had, had a couple of songs up the sleeve. So we went in there and did a couple of songs there. So um, one of them, Double Business Bound, it's a song from that session. Every studio has got its own personality in a way. So, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's so good to be able to take advantage of of that. And, of course, we, what space you're in and, and all that kind of thing. Yeah. Um, yeah. I want to go back to sort of your, your book, which came out, I think it was six years ago now. Um, and... and it was, you know, the, the story of Paul Kelly from, you know, you know, growing up and, and uh, the Did influence you of your parents. You, you, you're, you're brutally honest about um, a lot of things in your life, you know, love and, and love lost, but also, you know, the, the, the drug scene as well in Melbourne. And I know that would have had a huge influence on your, you know, your music back then. And was that scary to sort of talk about that, you know, publicly, I guess? Uh, yeah, I, I thought long and hard about about writing about it when I was doing the book. Mm. But I knew, you know, the book was a memoir and I'd read, you know, so when, once I knew I was writing a memoir, which again happened by accident, I started writing liner notes for these A, a to Z recordings. So and that's how the book took shape. And then I was like, oh, this is going to be a memoir. And then, and then I started reading other memoirs um, just to sort of get a feel for, feel for, for how they worked. And the ones that, you know, some some memoirs you could tell that was the stuff being held back or some, you know, stuff not stuff being hidden. And I, I came to the conclusion that if you're going to write a memoir, you need to pretty much lay, lay things on the table. I mean, obviously you don't, and obviously everyone everyone's going to spin their story their own way. But um, I think you need you've got to have an, enough honesty for. To make it work, I mean that's it's a memoir. It's a, that's the genre, and you need to honour it by by telling the truth. So, and I thought, um, uh, you know, I'd written, I've read a lot of stories or heard a lot of stories, as we all have, you know, about those redemption stories of um, taking drugs and going down into a, uh, a dark place and um, getting totally fucked up, and then clawing back to some kind of redemption. And uh, the, the, the story around heroin is always along those lines. And uh, I thought I had a slightly different story to tell because uh, I was a, a recreational user for over 20 years without, you know, ever having a habit. And that's not really, you don't really hear that kind of story that much. So, but it was, you know, I knew that it was sort of a thing I had to stop doing after a while. So I did. And then oh, I thought, well, let's, I think I can write about that in a way that might might be interesting. One one of your stories in a song is how to make gravy, and it's celebrated every year around uh, you know this time of year onwards. Um, and, and you played it last night as well. I saw a lot of people celebrating it online as as well at the SB. Um, is there a chance that the character you're writing about in To Her Door is the same person? I've always wondered that. Uh, oh yeah, I have a feeling that there's. Yeah, there's, there's a certain type of character that sort of wanders, has wandered through my songs mm. over the years. He could be in uh, To A Door. He could be in Love Never Runs On Time. Mm. He could be in How To Make Gravy, probably a few others, the older story in the book. Yeah, so, I mean, it's a sort of a, just a vague sense that a certain type of person. Um, but I, I kind of like that, 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 um, that there might be this, this sort of, characters sort of wandering through the songs over the years yeah, absolutely yeah and, and it's just one of those things where i've always had them in the back of my mind i'm like i've got to ask paul that you've got you've got a, a big year ahead the the album uh, is out this week and uh, and of course all the shows uh, the big arena shows like like you, you're playing arenas next year huge for you with a bunch of your mates um as well so starting off um august in perth and then through september so um you know that's going to be great paul you must be excited yeah about that. that's first time uh, headlined arenas so uh, i think it's going to be another uh interesting thing to do yeah 
Can I ask you what is in the, the rider backstage, by the way? Um, is, is, is it a strict one when you're doing big shows like that? Can you ask for a bit more? Well, yeah, I think we have a pretty modest ride. Just that, you know, we like, well, actually it's changed a lot because half three of the band now don't drink. So <laughs> well, we, get, you know, we get zero uh, zero beers. And, what are they called? Zero. Yeah. Well, heaps normal. Yeah. And heaps normal. They're, getting, yeah. they're making the beers pretty pretty well now with no alcohol. We have just like a, like a bottle of gin and uh couple of bottles of wine and some beers and some, you know, soda waters and mm. things like that. It's pretty normal. Yeah. <laughs> there's no there's no coloured smarties or anything like that. <laughs> well, Godinski would be very proud that you're uh, doing the big shows next year, and we all are, and, and, and it, it gets said, but it's so damn true. You are a national treasure, and once again, uh, congratulations uh, on your new album, and um, I can't wait to get everyone's reactions when it, when it comes out this week. And, Paul, thanks for the chat. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot, Chris. Good on you. Thanks for time, mate. Bit. I really appreciate it, yeah. mate. See you next year. Well, that is pretty cool. Paul Kelly on the rider. Paul Kelly's new album, Fever Longing Still, his 29th album is out now. You can download it and also uh, stream as well on all platforms and also get it on vinyl. And his tour kicks off in August next year as well with a whole bunch of uh, his favourite artists. An arena tour for Paul Kelly, something to get excited about in 2025. Thank you for tuning into The Rider with Becco. Give it a like on Instagram and also follow on Spotify, Apple or iTunes, wherever you get it. We'll catch you back soon. This is The Rider with Becco.